Hi everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure for me to be here. I feel that Marcus doesn't need any kind of introduction because he's so well known already as a mathematician. Um, but I will uh, give you a story of how I first met him. Um, it was a few years ago. I was introducing him for a BBC um, radio programme I was making on Indian science. And the reason was, um, for a few years, I'd been interested in this manuscript called the Bakshali Manuscript, uh, which is a very ancient um, Indian text that had been discovered many years ago and then brought to this country um, because of colonialism. And um, in it, you see evidence not only of the very complex and wonderful, very early maths, and when I say early, I mean early for the world, math, mathematical ideas, but also um, the zero, which some people attribute as an Indian invention. So this, it may seem very simple, but actually it's very crucial in the development of mathematics, and we, it's so important in how we use maths today. And Marcus, being at Oxford, um, where this manuscript is kept, um, had also taken a huge interest in it and driven the university to study it properly, date it properly, and um, that's wonderful. And it kind of speaks to his interest, his fascination, with maths, not just in the Western context, but in a global context. In fact, he's even taken a play that he wrote to India, had it performed in Mumbai, he himself performed in it, and I hope it goes back to India. Again, perhaps for the Jaipur Lit Fest, you never know. Um, <laughs> good, big plug. <laughs> um, so he, he's a wonderful thinker in that way. He's not just a mathematician in his ivory tower. He really reaches out to everybody and... Um, his new book, The Creativity Code, which I've had the huge pleasure of reading, is um, a reflection of that, uh, really demonstrating how he goes beyond his discipline and tries to understand where these mathematical ideas sit in society and how they will affect us, how they will affect our kind of development of our understanding of ourselves. So I'm fascinated to hear him. In case you're not fully aware of who he is, although I'm sure you all are. He is, um, of course, a celebrated mathematician at Oxford and a public uh, professor of public understanding at Oxford University. He's presented lots of programs on mathematics, um, and I just can't wait to hear him. So over to him. <laughs> I feel a little bit like Angela and I are, are related because we share a, an editor at Fourth Estate for our book. So it's like we're kind of siblings in the publishing world. Um, uh, and uh, let me, that probably should be showing something. Uh, let me just sort this out. Um, uh, I'm going to just change my display settings so you can see what I see. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Now, this is a talk, actually, I'm going to be talking about AI, um, and I'm going to use a bit of tech. So already my tech is challenging this. <laughs> there we go. Um, so usually you get told to turn, oh, I have to stand here because I'm not. Uh, usually you get told to turn your mobile phones off in a talk. But now I want you to turn your mobile phones on if you have them, um, and if you can get onto a Wi-Fi or use um, a local connection, because I'm going to try and get some interaction with you through your mobile phones. Um, so I'm going to be looking at the impacts that AI has had on the arts. So I've got a few art AI Turing tests for you as we go through the talk. Um, so I'm going to see whether you can sniff out um, what was created by AI and what was created by a human. And, and let's see how good AI has been at um, uh, sort of encroaching on something we believe is uniquely human. So what you need to do is just go to a, your browser, um, Okay, some, that's great. You, uh, turn your mobile phone on. It's already producing music, which I think was by a human, that one. Um, and if you put in, it's, it's a company called Glisser. So this is glsr.it, glsr.it forward slash creativity code. Um, at the end of the talk, you'll be able to download the slides so you can take those home with you, um, but also hopefully we'll get a little bit of voting um, uh, along the way. And if it doesn't work, then we'll go analog and I'll ask you to put up your hands. Um, uh, so I think that there's actually a lot of dystopia talked about uh, the impact that AI is going to have on our future, uh, that we're all going to get put out of jobs by AI. Well, actually, I suppose some people think that's a utopian thing. So um, maybe it's a utopian thing that we're all going to get put out of jobs and then we'll just uh, sit back and write poetry or something. Um, because I think there is one domain that we regard as sort of uniquely human, which AI surely can't get anywhere near, um, which is uh, creativity. That is... 
uh, the arts, the music, lighting, literature, what we're celebrating here at this festival, um, is surely a unique expression of what it means to be human. And how could uh, a, a, a bit of code get anywhere near what it's like to be um, human? Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, we felt that this is the one domain that, yeah, they might be driving our cars, being our lawyers, being our doctors, um, and we'll all be put out of jobs and we'll be sitting back and, and, and just showing our creative sides. But what I want to show in this talk is that actually the code that's beginning to emerge recently is actually doing something quite extraordinary and I think uh, is the first hints of uh, creativity um, in a machine. And I think the, what started me off on this kind of journey was um, a new story that broke um, a couple of years ago um, when uh, a company in London, DeepMind, produced this bit of code um, that they believe could play uh, the ancient game of Go. This is a game with 19 by 19 uh, grid where you put black and white stones down. The, you have to try and surround your uh, opponent's territory before they surround yours. Um, it's a game which requires um, a, a lot of pattern recognition. As you see the stones go down, you sort of see the patterns building up, and you're not quite sure often why you make a move. There's a lot of intuition that you build up a feel for this game. It's regarded as a, a highly creative game in the way that you play it. And in particular, if you talk to somebody who plays Go, they find it very difficult to articulate why they're doing particular things. So traditionally, this game was a game that computer science couldn't get anywhere near coding up how to play this game. They just couldn't see what the ifs, thens would be in order to be able to play. Um, you know, we've had uh, computers playing chess, and chess is a much more kind of uh, the logical implications of a move following those through, and they could code that up. Um, so when Lisa Doll was told that a company in London had produced some code, Lisa Doll sitting there on the right, uh, champion Korean player at this game, and uh, was told that a piece of code wanted to challenge him to a, a match over five games, he was totally dismissive um, of, of this project. Any code up to that point couldn't even beat an amateur at this game. Um, uh, however, when he sat down and played uh, this uh, piece of code, uh, it demolished him four games to one. And that one game that he did win, he now regards as the most valuable game of his whole career that he was able to beat this beat, bit of code at this game. So not so extraordinary that we've got computers doing kind of uh, things at such extremes. We've already seen, as I said, chess, um, other examples of computers being able to do calculations far faster than I can as a mathematician. Um, but I think it wasn't just that this was able to play this game at such a high level. It was showing indications that was playing it in a completely new way that we didn't recognize and in a way that I think that we should regard as a, a creative way of playing because in particular something happened in the second game um, of, of this match. Um, this is uh, the, the layout at um, uh, sort of j just after the beginning of the game. Uh, on, uh, Lisa Doll was playing white. He put a white stone down on move 36, went to the top of the hotel um, uh, to smoke a cigarette. Uh, humans need kind of nicotine for stimulation. Um, uh, computers don't, so it could just sit there. After a while, the computer then uh, suggested that the human player Actually, this wasn't an exercise in robotics. We still find it quite difficult to get a, a machine to pick a stone up and put it very carefully on the board. This was just pure thought. Suggested the human player put a stone, oh, I've circled the black a stone with a little white circle, on the fifth row in from the edge. Now, traditionally, when you learn to play this game at a very high level, your Go master uh, teaches you that you should not play any further in than the four rows in from the edge early on in the game. Early on in the game, you're kind of uh, competing for territory on the very extremes and just on the tight uh, sort of inside of the board. Um, and it's considered anything uh, further in than four rows is a very weak move. So when uh, AlphaGo uh, said, I want to put a stone down on the fifth row in, I remember watching these obsessively on YouTube because um, actually I've always thought the game of Go is rather like doing mathematics. Um, and uh, I thought, well, if a computer can't play Go, it's never going to be able to do maths. Um, uh, so I was, I was going through a slight existential crisis as I watched these kind of live uh, games on YouTube. And uh, I remember the commentators at the time, as this move was made, just gasping. They were, oh, wow, 
AlphaGo has made a huge mistake. Uh, Lee Sedol will be able to clear, clean up on this game. Um, you, you just That's such a weak move. Um, and Lee Sedol, when he came back down from the uh, rooftop, he looked at what AlphaGo had uh, played and was just couldn't... He was very suspicious, um, but just like, that is not a good move. Uh, why is it making such a bad move? Um, of course, what they discovered was, as the game went on and more and more stones got put down, and it's interesting, this game increases in complexity in contrast to chess, which actually gets simpler because pieces get taken off the board. That's one of the reasons this is quite hard to play as the game goes on, because it gets more and more complex. Um, as the game went on and territory started to build from the bottom right-hand corner, it turned out that AlphaGo's placing that black stone early on in the game completely allowed uh, the machine to control this territory and it won that second game. So for me, this is a really interesting move because I think it passes three qualities that I'm looking for in something that I regard as creative. And actually, I spent a, a couple of years just recently on a committee at the Royal Society here in London. Um, uh, we were looking at the impact that this new AI machine learning um, is having on society. You see, the interesting thing about how this code was created, um, code in the past used to be written in a very top-down manner. You had to tell the machine what it was going to do. But something has changed a couple of years ago where we've understood that we can get the computer to learn and rewrite its own code as it makes mistakes and learns. So actually the way this uh, code had uh, got written was it was taught how to learn and change and adapt. So it learnt on human games on the internet, lots of human games, understood the moves and kind of uh, in, uh, parameterized those as, as more likely moves that it would make, the ones that won put somebody in the game. Then it actually created a lot of synthetic data. It started playing itself and making lots of artificial games, seeing you know, which uh, uh, kind of versions of itself would be stronger and which are weaker and uh, sort of uh, re-emphasizing those moves. Um, so actually by the end, the people who wrote the code at DeepMind didn't really understand how the thing was playing the game. So the code is now being written in this very bottom-up manner, where a little bit like a child, we give birth to a child, it has our code, our DNA, but it then engages with its environment and then learns uh, new ways of behaving and becomes something independent from us as the parents. So this is what's happening with this machine learning, such that the code was making these moves that even the person who wrote the code didn't understand quite why it was making that move, uh, move 37. Um, so I think that's what's exciting, uh, that we're starting to see code almost have a little bit of autonomy from the coder. And so we've been looking at the impact of this new code on society at this committee at the Royal Society. Demis Sasabis, who was the mind behind DeepMind um, and AlphaGo, was on the committee. Um, but there was also an interesting woman, um, a philosopher, uh, Margaret Bowden. And uh, she's been thinking a lot over the years about what computers, or what she calls tin cans, uh, might be able to achieve. And so she's been interested in the idea of computer creativity. And she has a nice um, uh, working definition of what creativity is. I think uh, we can debate actually whether this captures what you believe creativity is. And in the book I've written, I I've kind of considered uh, various different varieties of creativity, but I think this one's quite a useful um, definition to take. She said it should be something which is new. Well, it's easy for a computer to make new things. It can quickly churn out new things, but it's these other two values. It should be surprising and it should have value. Now, novelty, of course, is something we can judge objectively, but surprise and value are very subjective. Uh, what's valuable for you, you might write a poem and value it very highly, but for the public at large, it has no value at all. Um, so if an AI is going to uh, be able to produce something that we, as a species, think is creative, it's got to learn on what we have found surprising. Those moments in history where there's been a shift in, in the kind of art world or and what things we value, which of course changes over, over time and, and place across the world as well. Um, so, but this is what machine learning is very good at. It takes data and is told this is something that is valued in this particular culture, this is not valued, and will learn from that and may be able to push um, itself into things that, that we might find as a species uh, surprising and have value. Um, so I think that, that move 37 passes these three qualities because it's a new sort of move. It surprised the commentators because they all gasped when it was made. Yet in this very night tight confines of a game, we could judge its value because ultimately it won AlphaGo the game. 
And what's exciting for me as I've looked over the last couple of years um, in writing this new book, The Creativity Code, um, is I've had a kind of image uh, which has been running alongside many of the stories, which is as humans, we get very, we think we found the best way to do things. Every uh, culture thinks they found the best way to play the game of Go, for example. Um, and uh, we sort of get stuck in this particular way of thinking. Um, Actually, I think we as humans quite often slip into behaving much more like machines and just repeat behaviours. I know that I do that in my mathematical work. I sort of repeat the things that have worked before. Um, and, and sometimes you need a push to, to take you outside of your comfort zone. And I think this is what we're seeing um, in something like AlphaGo. Um, it showed Go players now that the way they were playing is not an optimal way. There is a much a uh, better way to play this game. But it took the risk of going across those kind of adaptive valley and finding an even a higher peak. So, so this is what I've seen so often in uh, this book looking at the impact of AI on creativity. Weirdly, it's helping humans to be, behave less like machines and more creatively as humans because it's offering us exciting new possibilities. And so that's been the journey of this book, The Creativity Code. If I noticed this moment, which I think was a real phase change in AI happening a couple of years ago. And I wanted to see um, across other different disciplines um, how creative can AI be. And, and especially the creative arts where judging value is much more uh, a tricky thing to do than, say, the value of winning a game. Um, so I've looked at uh, music, or written word, literature, poetry, I'm gonna, but I'm going to start actually uh, looking at the visual world, because this is a place that AI has been incredibly successful in the last couple of years. I made a program for the BBC, this Horizon program, um, our kind of science magazine program, about AI about five years ago, where there was a touring anniversary. And I was very disappointed in what AI was achieving at that point. Um, in particular, one of the great hurdles it could not pass was, if you give it an image, it couldn't tell you what was in that image. It would read off the pixels, but it couldn't make sense putting those pixels together to integrate them into a story that it could identify. But by training on data and being told, well, actually, in this picture is a picture of a cat, and this one's a picture of a dog, and this one's a picture of a Christmas tree, and this one's a picture of something else, it began to understand what questions to ask about an image so it could identify. And this learning process has produced an extraordinary powerful kind of uh, set of algorithms which can identify. If you take a Google image recognizer, for example, give it any image, extraordinary how uh, quickly it can recognize what's in the image. So I'm going to start with um, looking at, if it's very good at recognizing images, how good is it at creating images? Um, so actually, uh, uh, let me go back a little bit, because um, this idea of uh, you know, can code be creative in these artistic realms um, actually goes back a long way. because. One of the very first coders in history. I mean, we celebrate Ada Lovelace um, as the first coder um, in Victorian age. We celebrate Ada Lovelace Day um, in October, I think it is. Um, and she was taken along by her mother to see. Uh, her mother wanted to expand her education. Would take her along to scientific experiments. She took her along to uh, Charles Babbage's uh, analytic engine. This is a machine that Babbage had made out of cogs and things to do calculations. But Ada began to realize um, that this could do much more interesting things than just calculation. And uh, the notes that Lovelace wrote for a uh, paper about this are now regarded as the first examples of, of code being written, clever ways to make a machine do interesting things. Um, and already in those notes, Lovelace was uh, uh, kind of speculating on how far a machine could go. The engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. She was already beginning to think about the idea that this thing might be able to make music. After all, music is about interesting patterns and the development of patterns, a lot of connection with maths. So maybe it could do something as interesting as com composition. But she offered a little word of caution. Um, she wrote, it's desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the powers of the analytic engine. The analytic engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. And I think that's been the thought of code in the past, is that, well, surely if it's starting to produce interesting music, that really should be credited to the creativity of the, the human who coded um, that particular uh, algorithm. Um, so I think in the past, in this top-down manner, uh, it's the creative, creative one is still the coder. 
But that's why I think things have changed. Because the code is mutating, changing, developing, becoming something that we don't even understand quite why it's making its decisions, uh, maybe it's putting a bit of distance between the original coder and the actual code, such that maybe we can break this idea that it's only doing what we order it to perform. Maybe it's doing things which we didn't expect, like that move 37. So you've probably heard of the Turing test. Can a piece of code pass itself off as a human in an interaction online, for example? If you have one which is uh, um, the AI and one is a human, can you spot the difference? So there's been a proposal of a new idea, something called the Lovelace test. So this is the challenge of whether a machine can originate a creative work of art such that the process is repeatable. Um, so this means that the code must know what it's doing. It mustn't be some external randomness, um, a glitch in the machine, uh, which it can't reproduce. So it doesn't really know also why it's produced the piece of work. It should be able to repeat it. But the programmer, the original programmer, is unable to explain how the algorithm produced its output. So this is the challenge. Are there examples where we can see the Lovelace test being passed? So as I said, we're, we're going to turn to the visual world to start with. So here's your first challenge. Um, this is a machine learning uh, developed in uh, Holland. Um, they were uh, looking at Rembrandt. Rembrandt has a very specific style of painting. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send these to you now so you can start to look at them. So you're going to get a chance. I want you to vote for the one that you think was created by artificial intelligence. So you're going to press the picture and then send it to me. Um, so you're looking for the, the one which isn't human. Which one of these isn't human? Um, I'll go back and put them uh, up on big, so you should have got it onto your machines now. Um, so the, the interesting idea is that um, can the machine actually learn um, what uh, is special about a Rembrandt? You know, that use of light that Rembrandt has, so significant. Uh, the kind of look in the eye that you seem to be staring into the soul of the sitter. Um, so have they... Uh, how well have they, as this machine, learnt um, how the great artists of the past have created their work to be able to, to produce their own? So hopefully, have you managed to send me some data? That's, that, that's working? Okay, so um, let's see what you're thinking about. So um, hopefully this will download. Okay, so um, pie charts work uh, clockwise. So the red is actually the image on the left. Um, because Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, we should be in Australia or something, and then it would all be upside down. But um, so, the, uh, so the red, so uh, there's a kind of little bit of a majority amongst you going for the one on the left being the AI. Um, but we can see we're not too sure here. In fact, this is quite a Brexity vote, I'd say. Um, <laughs> uh, really not sure whether to be in or out. Um, uh, so uh, let's see, you know, were you good at sniffing out uh, the thing with the Rembrandt shutter? Um, so very good, yes. So you managed to get that one right, the majority. Um, we're going for this image on the left is the one created by AI. Some, some ways and some woes. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think it's doing pretty well if it passes that kind of test. Um, this was even... Oh, your left, of course. I'm not talking about my left. I'm, I'm good enough to be, you know, I, 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 my, my wife is a yoga teacher, so I know how to invert my... Um, uh, so, uh, so you're thinking my, about my left. You're being too clever. Oh, I, I've said the left, and you're staring at it. So um, uh, you're being too clever if you're inverting. Well, well, he's standing that way, so he probably means. Um, so no, I, I'm going to try and uh, you know do a yo proper yoga class where when I talk do things like this, um, you'll be doing it on 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 your left. Yeah. Okay. So so now you feel a bit cheated because you actually voted for the wrong one, uh, or you got it right and you got it wrong or whatever. No, okay. So right. Um, so we will get this. Uh, I think this is quite interesting because this is also done. You know, this is, I've given you a 2D image, but actually, of course, if you go to a Rembrandt, it's, the way he puts paint on is so special. It's kind of really topographical. Um, and they actually analyzed the, the way his paint works and 3D printed this. Um, and they got an expert who, uh, from Holland, a Rembrandt expert, who came along and was really dismissive of this whole thing, thought it was horrible, um, and, and wanted to find some way to criticize it. And the only thing he could criticize it for is that the style of paint was actually 20 years earlier than the actual style of the portrait, which I think if they were just failing on that level, they were doing amazingly well. So, um, OK, uh, uh, a lot of people didn't like this project. One of my favorite art critics in The Guardian, Jonathan Jones, he hates anything to do with AI and art. Um, he wrote this about the, the Rembrandt project. What a horrible and tasteless, insensitive and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature when technology is used for things it should never be used for. Um, but frankly, anyone who wears a shirt like that, uh, I do not really <laughs> trust as an art critic, but um, 
Uh, but uh, I would say, in some ways, he has a point. You know, uh, why, why do we need to go back and make pastiche of things that are already fantastically wonderful? We don't need another Rembrandt. Um, well, I do think there's a point, because actually, machine learning is enabling us to spot new patterns in, in old data. So it's actually telling us new things about works of art that we didn't really realize made um, a, an artist particularly uh, special, something that they were doing. For example, Jackson Pollock, what makes a Jackson Pollock so unique? Turns out a mathematical algorithmic analysis reveals that he has a very specific geometric um, uh, shapes that he's making called a fractal of a particular fractal dimension. And it's only by using these tools that we spotted the unique thing that he's doing, so much so that we can actually now dismiss a lot of Pollocks that uh, people have uh, found in their attics and things, which turn out to just be their kids splattering paint on a canvas. So there is a point about looking in the past um, and learning from that. After all, how do we become creatives? We learn from the creative, the art of the past to be able to push into the new. But the exciting thing is how can we use AI to push into the new? So here I've got four paintings that are done by a human and four paintings that are done by artificial intelligence. So I'm going to send these to you now. Uh, you now have to press on the image that you think is the artificial intelligence. Actually, yes, of course, the vote didn't depend on whether I went left or right, so that's fine. Yeah. Now I've just worked that out. So, um, uh, so uh, you've got to work out which of these um, do you feel uh, has not got any kind of emotional will behind it, which ones. Um, uh, so are you, you may, may be able to send those to me? Is that working? Yes. Good. yes, let's have a look. So, so I'm going to reveal the data. So again, remember the red. Uh, the first one is, is voting for the image on the... Um, your left. Yes, very good. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so um, so this a uh, bit more. So this is two thirds, one third that um, you're going for the images on the right um, uh, as the AI ones. Um, uh, who voted uh, for the ones on the right being AI? Anyway, yes. Yeah, so do you want to say what? What? what uh, let me go show you those again. So, uh, what? What do you feel for you is giving that away as AI? Interesting. Yes, I, I think this idea that um, uh, uh, I have this quite a lot when I've, I've used this challenge a few times, and, and that seems to be one of the key things. The complexity of this thing seems to be giving it away because you're absolutely right. It, it is um, uh, the one uh, that one on the so these the AI ones are these ones on the uh, right, and I think there's a. It's interesting you say perfect because I wouldn't say they're perfect, um, but but I think it's a complexity thing which. Is sort of the simplicity of this. Although, you know, I think uh, that image looks very like, like a random walk or something that a computer might generate. Um, for me, what's exciting about this project is actually, um, so as, let me say, these were shown in Basel Art Fair a couple of years ago. Uh, the people who came to visit the gallery were not told that there was any AI involved in these things at all. Um, and actually, these four on the right, your right, um, people said had a much greater emotional response to these um, than the ones on the left. Um, and you might say, OK, if I then tell you they're AI, um, a lot of people feel deeply cheated. that Because um, you've thought, oh, no, but I thought I was kind of connecting with some, some sort of uh, human world, internal world. Um, and actually, I, I don't think one should feel cheated. I mean, first of all, if I tell you a joke and you laugh, and then I say that was created by artificial intelligence, that doesn't invalidate your laughter, does it? I mean, you don't suddenly not find it funny. But the interesting thing is here, these AI, this AI is learning on our emotional world. It's taking the art of the past um, and learning about what we find surprising, what we value. So it's um, actually what we're get, getting is a kind of new filter on our emotional world. So I don't think it is so crazy that you have some resonance with these, if you do, um, because they are based on a learning of, our, of work that does have emotional resonance. Um, the interesting thing is how these were made. These are, this is not just one algorithm, but two algorithms kind of working against each other in something that we call a creative adversarial network. Um, so one algorithm is tasked with looking at all of the art of the last 1,500 years and starts to understand what distinguishes particular styles. So it becomes an art historian, basically. It can identify a cubist painting, pointillist painting, and then it's tasked in its creativity with making something that doesn't fit into any of those patterns. It must make something which cannot be classified within, within its learning. So it's pushed into the new. However, it mustn't make something so new that we don't recognize it as art. So it understands what is art, 
but it's not going to make something that we've seen before. The discriminator algorithm, the second algorithm, instead of sort of working in this game, is tasked with trying to say, no, that, I recognize, that's still a style that's uh, very clearly cubist, um, or that is not art. So the two are working together in tandem such that the piece that's produced at the end is pushing into the new and is something that um, will be recognizable as art. Um, um, so I think this is exciting because I think that actually captures very much the creative process in humans. I think we have this kind of explosion of ideas and creativity I and mean, then we, we kind of judge ourselves and say, well, no, that's not quite right. You, I mean, I, I do this with my mathematical work. I kind of play this good cop, bad cop. I, I try and do something exciting and then I judge it and say, no, that's not gonna work because of this. And here's Paul Valéry, French poet, who said, it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations and the other one chooses. Um, so I think this is quite exciting projects, this idea of creative adversarial networks pushing our creativity in interesting new ways. But weirdly, one of the interesting stories I saw on the visual world is some art which, uh, frankly, is pretty kitsch as art goes, but I think is starting to get to the interesting idea of why we create art. Why do we write novels? Why are we talking about the novels here at this festival, the poetry? Um, uh, you know, we're in the library with so many. I think it's a, the, the trouble is that our internal worlds and the way I see the world might be very different from yours, and we want to share those. We want to find some way to share those. Now, I think that the AI that's beginning to appear, we don't really understand its internal world. We don't know why it's making the decisions it is. So this is a project where we're trying to see how is the visual recognition software actually seeing the world? Sure, it might be able to say cat, dog, lion, but what is it really seeing? So uh, what Google did is to kind of reverse the process. Um, this is a project called Deep Dream. So they gave um, the visual recognition software an image which has hardly anything in it. So in this case, we've got some jellyfish. Sometimes they just give it random pixels. And then they would ask the AI to just dial up and accentuate whatever it was seeing in the image. Um, in the same way, you look up in the clouds and you'll say, oh, I see a rabbit there or a snake. Um, so this is what happened with this particular image. Once it was dialed up, suddenly this extraordinary cacophony of animals, of eyes, of uh, kind of uh, skin uh, um, started appearing in this image. This is what the AI was seeing inside that just that very simple picture. And, and for me, this is tells you a little bit about how the AI has learned. Because uh, it, animals are a lot of its training data, things, faces, uh, things with eyes, uh, th mechanical things, um, so there's a kind of weird light uh, that's appearing at the bottom there. We are learning how it has learned. Um, but that can also give us some indication of biases that might be beginning to appear in the data. I think that we think uh, uh, algorithms are kind of neutral and amoral and, and just don't have any uh, kind of biases to them because they're a bit of mathematics. But the learning it, it can have some interesting biases. So here's um, uh, an image. They just gave it a, a random uh, kind of gray pixels and the AI started to see dumbbells emerging in the AI. But um, the dumbbells always came with an arm attached to them. Why? Because it only trained on images where it had seen dumbbells being held by strong men and women. It didn't understand that this wasn't part of our anatomy. So I think this is a very interesting project where it can actually the art might help us to understand the rather mysterious internal decision-making process of the AI. I did an event last year with, uh, at, at Wired um, with a woman from MIT Media Labs. Uh, she's a roboticist. Um, and, and she told a story about how uh, she'd been given these robots to work with, and the robots just wouldn't recognize she was in front of the robots. Uh, why? Because she was black. When she put a white mask on, suddenly they responded and started engaging with her. Um, so she's now started something called the uh, Algorithmic Justice League, um, which is a great name. She's, she's also a fantastic poet as well. She's got a way with words. Um, and this is a project really to examine a lot of the learning process to make sure that the data it's training on um, it, it ha doesn't have biases inside it. And I think um, you know, art uh, could well be a, a very good way to, to make visible the things which are invisible. As Paul Clay said, art does not reproduce the visible. That's not interesting. It makes things visible. Um, and as Marshall McLuhan said, art is our distant early warning system. It's always relied on to tell the old culture, that's us, 
what is beginning to happen to it. So I think very exciting uh, that one that, and that's the role that art can play. Not, uh, you know, Jonathan Jones I think thinks that art is meant trying to be like Rembrandt. The most interesting examples are where AI art is helping us to understand the internal world of the AI. Um, music is very interesting. There's a lot about music in the book, and I've done some interesting projects about creating Bach AI hybrids uh, where people just uh, can't understand where the Bach stops and the AI starts. Why? Because music has a lot of patterns in it. If you play a piece of music, um, uh, I've just been at a concert at the Wigmore Hall uh, uh, listening to a piece of uh, Benjamin Britten quartet. As soon as it started, you just heard there's characteristic ways that he puts notes together. And you can very quickly, if I'd not been told it was Benjamin Britten, I'd have been able to pick up that signature pretty quickly. So AI is being pretty successful in reading signatures of particular composers and being able to push into new directions. But this was one of, the, again, the most interesting stories I saw on the musical front. And this is a jazz musician, Bernard Lubat, uh, Parisian uh, pianist. Um, and uh, at Sony Labs in Paris, they got uh, an AI to train on his particular style of jazz playing. It learned the sort of, almost probabilistically, if you, if you do a sequence of notes, where is it likely to go next? Um, and they coded this up, and they got the two playing together in a concert. And people were challenged to try and identify where the human was and where the AI was. And again, they often attributed the more complex music to, they thought it was the human, but it turned out to be the AI. AI actually is pushing the complexity of the playing. But it was Bernard Lubat's response. He said, the system shows me ideas I could have developed. He recognized it as his sound world. This person was, pl this person, this AI, very easy to anthropomorphize this AI. Um, uh, but it was, it would have taken me years to actually develop. Um, so it's years ahead of me, yet everything it plays is unquestionably me. So again, this is, I think, a really powerful tool for us as humans to, to understand our creative world and perhaps show us that even within the world that we are uh, playing in at the moment, there are new things that we can do with that. Um, so a, a great tool to push our own creativity. Um, what about the written world? We're here at the literary festival. Um, so how is it going to be able to write a novel? You know, you're you going to have, a, when is it at the Jaipur Literary Festival will have a piece of AI sitting up there telling you about its um, new novel? Um, well, actually, writing is one of the very early things that um, AI started to do. So this is actually um, the Manchester Universal Computer that Turing built after um, the war in Bletchley Park. Uh, so he went up to Manchester, built this thing, uh, and they were a bit perplexed, uh, the team, uh, that after a while they kept on finding these love letters uh, from the machine scattered around the lab. Um, and so this, it turned out to be um, one of the team had made a template and was using a random number generator that Turing had made, which was choosing randomly um, uh, words of love to substitute into this template. And after a while, you'd sniff out that the template, it was, they were all the same structure. Um, and it's interesting that use of a random number generator, because I've seen this a lot in uh, AI artists kind of trying to give the um, AI some sort of uh, uh, decision-making process that we don't understand. But I think that's a cheat because it isn't a decision-making process. It's randomness. It's not intentioned uh, thought. So, so I think randomness you'll often see uh, being used as a kind of substitute for some sort of um, uh, 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 kind of choices being made. But I think that's, uh, uh, that's not really an interesting way to be creative. It can help creativity here. As Leonardo, he used to throw a, a rag at a canvas and just, uh, it would fall down and he would get inspired by the random thing that appeared on the canvas. Anyway, so poetry, I think, is a place where AI has been quite successful. Because again, it's a very closed form. Often poems are a little bit gnomic. I think that you know, creativity is an interesting thing because you as an audience bring a lot of your own creativity to a piece. Um, there should be room for your own world to inhabit it as well. So my, my next tests are, are three AI poetry tests, okay? So I'm going to give you three poems and you've got to try and guess whether they're bot or not, okay? So um, uh, here's your first one. I, I won't read all of this. Um, I'll read it and then I'll send it to you to vote on, okay? Um, Mortal My Mate. Bearing my rocker heart, warm beat with cold beat company. Shall I earlier or you fail at our force and lie the ruins of rifled once a world of art? Okay, so um, there you go. Uh, you just have to press whether you think that is a bot or do you think it's not? Do you think that's human? Um, so uh, i give you a chance to, to vote on that one. Um, and let's start to reveal the answers. Uh, what are you thinking about this one? 
Okay, so again, bot it was on the uh, my left. So uh, most of you are going for that. It was actually created by um, uh, a piece of AI. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to give the answers away yet. So let's go on to your second challenge. This is even quite hard to read. Um, there are smallnesses of plasticide reaction of real time, of packs, of displaced exclusionary heart, hurt, of powerlessness, magazine fired, non dignified, as head, fatty, in plain, internalized violence, to frozen helplessness, off white, chalulididididid. Okay, um, so um, your chance now. Do you think that that was a bit of crazy code created by a computer trying to communicate something, or was that a human? What was she asking? <laughs> what does she think? <laughs> um, I, so, uh, am I, basically, am I messing with you? Because it clearly looks like a bit of code, doesn't it? But um, let's see what you're thinking. Um, OK, so actually, uh, so most of you are thinking that's human, because why would he stick a load of code up? So you're all trying to second guess me, I can see. Okay. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. OK, so, so you think that was a human? Crazy, completely meaningless, but anyway. Um, all right, so here's your last one. Imagine now the dark smoke. Awaken to fly all these years to another day. Notions of tangled trees, the other side of water. I see it is already here. Sequences of her face. See it is shared, and old friends pass their dreams. OK, so there's your chance. Do you think that was written by a computer, or do you think by a human? So again, press which one you think. Send it to me, and let's start to see the data. Um, okay, then. OK, so a little bit undecided on that one, a bit Brexity again. Um, so majority going for that one, probably the computer. OK, so let's reveal the answers. Um, so I think you went uh, computer, human, computer, was what you thought. OK, poor old Gerald Manley Hopkins is going to be turning in his grave. Uh, you all thought, well, that's, you know, there was a lot of you thought that was computer. So this is to his watch. Um, I chose Gerald Manley Hopkins because I've never understood any poem that he's ever written. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry for any General Manley Hopkins fans. Um, uh, okay, so you sniffed out that the next one looks too much like code for really be a computer. So yes, indeed, this is an Australian uh, poet, uh, Mez Breeze, who's very interested in uh, the idea that code does have a kind of poetry, a rhythm to it, um, yet it's trying to communicate something. It has its own internal, internal thing that the computer understands, but yet it's somehow part of our world as well. So um, very interesting. So that's two humans. So the last one, you were right. You sniffed out um, just um, that this is, in fact, a piece of AI created by Ray Kurzweil. Uh, talks a lot about the singularity, the moment computers will just take over the world. Um, it's this, called the cybernetic poet. And it learns on a lot of uh, you know, Yeats, or Eliot, um, uh, Tennyson. And it could then reproduce something that's sort of often a hybrid style of those. Um, OK, so poetry, yeah, it's, it's small. And it's um, any, any of you read Ian McEwan's new novel, um, the AI there, the, the robot, um, it loves making haikus. Um, in, in the last, oh, no, I shouldn't give away the, the, the ending of that. It's a good book to read it. Um, um, and uh, so what about literature? Well, there was a team uh, called a botnik uh, uh, create, using AI to create some interesting things who were very disappointed that um, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling only wrote seven volumes of Harry Potter and wanted an eighth. Um, so they decided, OK, well, we can just train the AI to learn how, uh, you know, what uh, Harry Potter series is about, the, way, the style of writing. Um, so uh, uh, they learned on, on the thing, and, and they produced this eighth volume. It's actually a great title. It's called Harry Potter and the Portrait of What Looked Like a Large Pile of Ash. <laughs> what, a, what a great name for a book. Anyway, it started off pretty well. Magic. It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. So great, it's already identified the magic as an important theme in these books. So pretty good going. Leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost. Oh, yeah, that's a lovely image. Leathery sheets of rain. I think it's quite nice. Um, as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Uh, uh, doing pretty well, but then it started to lose the pot. Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. Um, he saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. That's Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so at the moment, uh, AI text generation doing quite good making locally meaningful sentences, but has no sense of global structure. And even in the music, if you take the AI jazz improviser, it's quite good for five minutes. But after that, it gets deeply boring because it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So AI is 
quite good at locally generating things of interest, but doesn't seem to be able to do global structure. And I think, you know, this is, as I said before, why do we write all the novels that are being celebrated in this festival? Why is a library that we're in uh, full of just, uh, you know, the thoughts of people? I think this is because our art, our literature, our music expressing our in emotional world um, is one of our best tools to try and answer one of the great challenges of science, which is the hard problem of consciousness. We don't really understand what it is that to put some stuff together and, and then it to have an internal world. We don't understand whether our internal worlds are actually the same. When I talk about pain, um, is my pain anything like your pain? Uh, we share these words in kind of Wittgensteinian word games, but we don't really know how close our internal worlds are. And I think uh, that's why we create art, why we write novels, is to get inside the head of the other. Um, George Eliot wrote, the greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether painter, poet, or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies. Art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. And I think as we go forward, our, the AI that we're beginning to see emerging is starting to have an internal world that we don't really understand. The, the way it's recoding itself and, and becoming distant from the original coder means that it's making decisions which it can't articulate very clearly and when we even look at the code, we can't understand. And I think there'll be a point where, when my iPhone will one day be a conscious entity. It'll suddenly go, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am. And, you know, am I going to have to... I'm going to need to know at some point, I think, whether this is a genuinely uh, internal world or whether maybe it's just faking it. Um, uh, and I think the art that the AI will produce, um, uh, ultimately, at the moment, it's a tool, I think, for our own human creativity and a great collaborator. But as we go forward, I think that it'll be key to really understanding, um, as Wittgenstein said, um, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand him because that internal world of the lion is built on so many different things that being a lion, what is it like to be a lion? I think what it's like to be an AI is gonna be really challenging, but the art that it produces, I think already is giving us a hint on how it sees the world. Thank you. to that forever, <laughs> even though I've read the book, <laughs> even then. Um, so Marcus is very kindly going to answer some of your questions now. I just wanted to take this opportunity to ask mine first, because flecked throughout your book is this kind of existential fear that AI will one, one day replace you as a mathematician, that we will not need mathematicians because computers will do the job instead. Do you think that's ever going to happen? Yes, yeah, so as I said, um, this game of Go, I think is very similar. I'd always use it as a protective shield. You know, I, a computer can't play Go, so it's definitely not going to be able to do maths. And so that's so. There's a big strand to the book, which is, I mean, I've talked about the art, but this is there's a major strand, as, as you said, um, which is about well, how good is AI at doing maths? Um, and actually, when I was sitting next to Demis at this uh, um, these meetings, and I, I kind of cheekily challenged him and said, um, uh, you know. We'd just both been elected as fellows of the Royal Society, very proud, both of us. Um, and I said, well, could you get your AI to be elected as a fellow of the Royal Society by making a great discovery? And he's, he turned to me and said, we're already on the case. And I, that, that was, it totally freaked me out. So there's a story about how, how good that is. Now, there's something interesting. You see, uh, why I think AI is having difficulty still with the written word is that uh, actually uh, we as humans don't need exposure to much data as a child to be able to start speaking. And this is kind of Chomsky's idea that we become pre-programmed a little bit for uh, the ability to, to, to create language. And if that's true, I mean, there are these things called Winograd challenges where um, uh, it, there's an ambiguous word, but because of context, we're able to identify very quickly whilst a computer just has no idea what the they is referring to. And I think that might be our, our saving grace in a way, that we our language has developed over millions of years of evolution, and, and then maybe the AI is gonna to have to go through a similar evolutionary process. But the trouble is maths, you see, is, is still a very new thing for us as a species. Although we have a number sense evolutionary-wise, actually, you know, 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, you've got uh, ancient Egypt, Babylon, India, um, the Greeks, it's actually still quite new. And so I think evolutionary-wise, we're still very young as mathematicians. So I think that an AI exposed to that mathematics of the past could well get to um, a level that it's starting to, to be able to make things which we'll be quite surprised by.
That's quite scary. To yeah, me. for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I became a writer. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. So do we have any questions? We've got one over here. If you just wait for the microphone. Thank you. So much of our lives has, as we've come to understand it, been a social construct. And in terms of race and in terms of gender, in terms of class, those have been hugely detrimental and oppressive in terms of us being able to move forward. My concern is in terms of artificial intelligence, because those gendered, class, racist prejudices are still so prevalent in terms of the people who have control, whether it's Google or whoever it is, in terms of basically these are not, as you indicated when you spoke, um, divorce of, you know, AI is not divorced from the prejudices of those who have been part of the process of programming them. So in terms of your perceptions and analysis of the future, how do you see us challenging the oppression that has basically stifled us and continues to do so? Uh, I think it, absolutely you, this is a, a huge challenge. Um, and it's partly why I wrote this book is to try and reveal to people um, uh, how this thing is working. So there's, you know, I, I spend a little bit of time just looking under the bonnet of how these algorithms work. So, Because I think uh, that's our the most powerful tool we can have is knowledge, um, to be able to understand when uh, there's a bias that's appeared or when it's starting to push me in a direction. You know, this is politically, uh, when we've seen Cambridge Analytica pushing us around, we need to understand what's happening. Um, uh, and very often we don't because we don't understand how the thing's working. So so I, I think it's, it's absolutely a huge challenge because, um, you know, as you say, these things are learning on our data. So unfortunately, it's picking up a lot of um, biases inside there as well. And there are, you know, horrific cases of where people are just able to um, influence the AI by their interaction with it. I mean, the, the case of uh, Microsoft had this little uh, chat bot on Twitter. Uh, within 24 hours, um, people have got hold of it and made it, you know, it was meant to be a 17-year-old girl, I think. Um, and by the end of 24 hours, she was spouting racist, uh, Nazi, just, uh, they had to take it offline uh, after 24 hours. So um, so there's a very, but I think, again, it, it's a uh, knowledge of, of how these things are working that is going to be our, our our greatest strength. One of the other ones that we suggested in the uh, Royal Society is, is uh, the idea of a data commons, that um, data, if anyone's read Surveillance Economics, um, this wonderful new book, uh, it basically says, you know, the Industrial Revolution, it was the laborer's work that was um, uh, being exploited. So you would do some work, get a, a living wage, but the person who owned the factory was making huge amounts of money off your, your labor. Today, it's data. We are giving our data um, uh, to, you know, we probably, some of you may have put in Google Maps how to get to the British Library. Um, you've, you've exchanged a bit of your data about where you are for um, coming here. Um, but uh, actually, the Google is able to exploit a huge amount of capital out of that little bit of data. So, so I think it's understanding the, the value of our data is going to be really important, and also this idea of a data commons. So all of the data should be available to everybody. So it shouldn't be in just the hands of um, a large corporations. That's suddenly, you know, the, why we're seeing these big, powerful people is that they're protecting their data and not making it available. And the frightening thing is something like health data, because you know, Deep Mind. Um, are doing some great things, but you know why should they be the only ones to have access to an uh, anonymized uh, NHS data? Um, yeah, they may be m making great strides in in uh, solving um, he health issues and great benefit for society, but that needs to be a, a, a common uh, that data should be in a data commons sort of uh, agreement. Interesting. There's a question here and then over here. Thank you for your talk. I last heard you talk 10 or 15 years ago. And if anything, you've got even better. <laughs> um, I wanted to say that looking at those four paintings, um, have you thought of asking people to press the button on the ones they would like to buy? Because that would suggest an emotional connection. And if the computer is reading our emotions, then it becomes a new dimension, which is rather exciting. Well, scary, really. Yeah, very interesting. I, I like that idea. Maybe I should uh, change the question because, um, you, you know, maybe you may still be able to identify those as 
maybe the AI, but you like them. So I will get a different kind of uh, bit of data out of that. And it's interesting you uh, raise the idea of uh, our emotional world and how AI is beginning to read it. Um, I had a woman from uh, MIT Media Labs came and give a, gave a big annual lecture that I organized in Oxford. And she's got AI, which is uh, beginning to be much better at interpreting uh, our our emotional world from our faces than humans are. So for example, uh, can you recognize when somebody is smiling but it's a false smile, they don't actually, they're not happy. Um, the AI was able to pick up things in the face um, which were indicators of this being somebody who didn't really want to be there but was still smiling, uh, much better than humans. Um, and she's using that actually for, for example, for autism, uh, that an autistic kid can use a pa pair of um, uh, you know, augmented reality glasses and be uh, told by the computer perhaps what you know that's the hard thing for an autistic person is to get inside the mind of the other um, it could read the emotional world and tell you um, sort of what the person is, is perhaps thinking so um, yeah it is frightening in some ways but also uh, maybe very empowering for some people there is in robotics as the phenomenon of the un uncanny valley that when robots start to look too much like us we get frightened which is why robotics experts don't design robots that look too much like us is there that element in ai as well that people are nervous that if they get too smart or too difficult for us to realize whether they're real or not human or not that we we're repulsed i i think we're, we're certainly it's interesting repulsion i, I think we're scared i think that, that that's the, that kind of fear and i think you know the fear is um well why will they need us? Sort of, you know. I think that's like I, I have this image that you know, in the future, we'll be in, behind cages in zoos, and the AI will come and say, "This is what we evolved from." You know, um, uh, and actually, one of the uh, I, I skipped over very quickly um, a, an image of um, uh, Ian McEwan, actually, um, uh, and, and this is kind of relevant to this because I was going to, but I wanted to get to the question time, but um, uh, because uh, we want the AI to be on our side. You know, and, and that's the kind of fear. And one of the main interesting stories I, I saw was um, uh, uh, was something called Scheherazade IF, Interactive Fiction. And this was um, so an AI that learned on how we tell stories as humans and then was offered the chance to tell its own story after its learning. Now, I used to love these books as a kid where you had to choose what page to go to. You know, if you want to go up in the attic, turn to page 47. Uh, go down into the cellar, uh, 22. Um, and if you've watched Bandersnatch, the um, Black Mirror, you know, that's the, your opportunity to make your own story. So the AI was given um, a sort of tree of possible stories to tell. And what was interesting is that after learning on our stories, it told a story which was much more humane, much more recognizable as something that was a, a, a human story. And so I think that that's the other thing. You can We want empathetic AI. And I think that by learning on our art, uh, my, you know, it, it Learning on our data might produce, uh, you know, bad things, but it could also produce something that will perhaps be more sympathetic with the way that we think. So, so I thought that was an it's interesting. Not real empathy, though, is it's not coming from the heart. It's not someone who can appreciate your pain or could ever go through it the way you would. Yes, I think that's. You, but you see, of course, um, I think. <laughs> yes, I mean. I, I, What's interesting is, of course, we don't know what um, each other's internal worlds are. So that, you know, you, I still have to... What, empathy is a very strange thing. I mean, I'm actually reading a very fascinating book on empathy by uh, somebody uh, from MIT at the moment. And, and it, it is, uh, you know, it is about uh, trying to share our internal... But I think that's the point, that this... In, we want the... So, yeah, is it empathizing? Well, let's mainly not to call, it, to call it empathy, but we want it to understand how we think such that it can it will do things which won't be destructive to us. Um, and actually, you see, ultimately, I think there will be something that we'll need to call the internal world of the AI. Uh, I think already the decision-making process, we don't understand it. it. It doesn't help to look at the code because just in the way that, you know, if you want to understand how, uh, uh, how we work, it's not good to look at the neuronal connections. We want to look at what we do um, to test whether somebody understands French we hear whether they can speak French. Um, we don't look at the internal world. So the same thing will happen with the AI. It's becoming too complex, and we need ways to kind of um, understand its internal world in a way. Um, thank you so much for a really great talk. Um, a lot of the things that you've been talking about sort of seem to exist within the realm of pattern recognition, about how... Um, a lot of the what we see, 
how we categorize what the AI is producing is on our capacity to recognize it as something that we recognize. Uh, so art that looks like art or music that sounds like music. Um, but are we not restricting these things to the limits of our own imagination? Um, is What is the f scope? What is the future um, if we were to actually just let the AI be intelligent? I think this is a great question because um, it, it's one that, uh, you know, we sort of feel like, well, how could the AI break the mold? And humans do do that, and it's an amazing moment. And I, I talk about three different sorts of creativity in the book, kind of exploratory creativity, which is pushing the system to its extremes. Um, you know, music, perhaps Bach really pushed the ideas of the Baroque, um, and then it bursts into something new. Um, then there's combinational creativity, uh, which is sort of combining different ways of thinking. So I often will go to seminars in a completely different area of uh, mathematics, and then I'll see the way they look at things and think, oh, I can use that in my... You know, and now that's what's great about going to different cultures as well, just experiencing a different way of seeing the world. Um, so I think both those things are possible within AI, uh, um, but it's the transformational creativity, which is a really hard thing. Well, the moment when uh, uh, something completely breaks, in mathematics, somebody comes up with the square root of minus one, an imaginary number. It, was, it had to be imagined. Um, uh, because, and how, so how could an AI that is taught that all numbers when squared are positive suddenly come up with that? Well, I think there is a way to do that. And what we're seeing is this machine learning is a kind of almost code and metacode. So you create metacode which says, OK, break the rules. And actually, that's what I tell my PhD students to do. Take a system and break it and see if something interestingly new emerges. Most of the time, it's destructive, and it just the whole thing is there for a reason, and it collapses. Um, but sometimes you'll, you'll change a rule, and you'll get um, you know, Euclidean geometry, parallel lines all uh, you know, don't meet. Uh, 19th century, somebody changed that and said, I, I don't think that's as fundamental as we think it is. Try something different. And you've got a whole new geometries emerging. So I think that that's still programmable. I think that's you make us so you can have systems within systems, and, and you can get a, a system to to break the rules of a uh, sort of uh, a system within it. Um, you, you know, there's always the challenge of you're still working within another system which has got its own internal rules. But but I don't think that um, most people are very pessimistic about well AI can't go outside of what we're doing anyway. But I think it can. Um, I'm really sorry, we don't have any more time for questions, but uh, Marcus will be here and you'll be signing books, is yeah. that right? So if you do have any questions for him, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them then. Thank you so much. Can we have a big round of applause? For him? Thank you.